this uh, fantastic, what I think will be a fantastic uh, a public lecture. I am Professor Nayani Kamukaji. Um, I am one of the co-directors um, at the IES for the Faculty of Social Science and Health. And uh, I am, uh, feel really fortunate to be able to um, chair um, this session. I actually really asked for this over another, another colleague who wanted to do it as well. So we had a bit of a tussle, uh, but I'm, I've got here. <laughs> Um, uh, to introduce our, um, our speaker here, um, Professor Catherine Besterman. Um, uh, Catherine is a Francis F. Bartlett and Ruth K. Bartlett Professor of Anthropology at Colby College in America. Her current research focuses on uh, the intersection of race, mobility, security, neoliberalism, and carcerality. Her most recent book, Militarized Global Apartheid, which came out in 2020, takes up these themes to detail the em emergence of iterating security regimes, regimes <coughs> that police and control mobility for the benefit of capital in ways that uh, reflect South Africa's uh, uh, former apartheid regime. Um, uh, and really amazingly, uh, this book has been recognized as a Public Anthropologist Prize in 2022. At Durham, she's pursuing research on the security imperialisms that undergrid and drive militarized global apartheid, and most particularly forms of carcerality. Professor Besterman will also engage with the Durham-led interdisciplinary project, The Politics of Credibility, and act as project advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Kersoglu, my colleague in anthropology, and also Dr. Olga Dimitriou in the government and international affairs who is here. Um, the project will cast fresh analytical light on the politics of credibility that underpin asylum determination regimes in UK and Europe, primarily in, the, in, the, in that of Greece, Cyprus, and Germany. Professor Besterman has done fieldwork in South Africa, Somalia, and the US. And after conducting ethnographic fieldwork in the late 80s, she amazingly uh, reunited with her former neighbors from Somalia when they began moving to Maine as resettled refugees in 2006. Her book, Making Refuge, Somali Refugee Camps, um, uh, Somali, uh, Somali Bound to Refugees and Lewiston, Maine, chronicles their journey from war to on Somalia. To, to Kenya's massive refugee camps, and finally to Lewiston. Her previous books include Transforming Cape Town um, uh, and Unraveling Somalia, and the edited volumes Life by Algorithms, The Insecure American, Why America's Top Pundits Are Wrong, and Violence, A Reader uh, uh, itself. She's passionate about the power of the public humanities and has organized statewide collaborative public humanities initiatives, including Freedom and Captivity in 2021, which promoted abolitionist vision for our main through exhibitions, webinars, performances, workshops, classes, and podcasts. A past president of the Association of Political and Legal Anthropologists and a 2012 Guggenheim Fellow, her work has been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Wernigrad Foundation, the American Philosophical Society, Sigma 11, the, the School of um, uh, Advanced Research, and the Tinker Foundation. And something that she doesn't say here, she's also the founder of the Network of Concerned Anthropologists, which was something which many of us who are at the ASA, Association of Social Anthropology in the UK, were very much uh, linked up to in terms of the link with the uh, uh, human terrain uh, uh, kind of system with linking up social scientists with the army. Um, so um, over to you, Catherine, to, uh, for your talk. Um, are we entering a new age of global apartheid? Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Um, I'm, I'm so delighted to be here, and I just wanted to open with um, with a lot of gratitude. Uh, it's, it's a thrilling thing as an academic to get a semester, to take up a fellowship with amazing colleagues at an amazing college town, university town, at an amazing university. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful for it. Um, between the IAS, which has proven to be just an incredibly collaborative, interdisciplinary place to locate myself and, and feel really inspired to do work to the beauty of Durham, um, it's, it's just been a joy. And so I, I feel deeply grateful. In fact, now I'm going to embarrass Jackie, we got to spend, if the, IAS is about interdisciplinarity. So I spent the last weekend um, with two other fellows, a political scientist and another fellow who uh, works on decarbonization initiatives in the shipping industry, mucking around, this is a new phrase I've learned, in the North Yorkshire Moors. And we were together for four days, climbing around on the moors, and we argued like passionately for four days about all the issues that we're here to work together on. And I was just like, I'm, a, I'm like such a nerd. This was like total heaven for me, you know, four straight days of fighting 
about reparations and sovereignty and borders and territoriality and nativism and nation state membership and identity and race and it was like yes just so awesome so uh, deep gratitude for the opportunity to be here and have these kinds of conversations I also want to express my my um, admiration for Thomas Mole the principal of Van Mildert and the welcome that he has offered to me here um, where I'm appointed Van Mildert has been a wonderful place to be situated and I've really enjoyed the extracurricular and co-curricular evenings that you all organize here especially around your ethic of social justice and community outreach it's been a delight to learn about the work that you're doing and, and I feel really grateful to have been located here so thank you um, as Professor Mukherjee explained, my career has been uh, uh, involved in a couple of different parts of the world. I started working in Somalia um, after the collapse of the Somali state and the advent of civil war. I continued for the next decade really trying to understand the inter underpinnings of what, of what caused state collapse and caused two million refugees to flood across the borders from Somalia um, seeking safety. After that, I worked in South Africa for another decade looking for um, lessons from a country that was emerging from decades of civil war and trying to embark on a process of social repair um, following you know, 40, 50 years of the imposition of apartheid, which as we know is a system of white supremacy. And then as Professor Mukherjee mentioned, the people who I had known in Somalia um, who got resettled into resettlement programs began moving to Maine, which is the state that I live in in the United States. And we completely coincidentally found each other in Maine after 20 years of uh, their having uh, been uh, incarcerated in a refugee camp. And I spent the next decade in Lewiston working with them, uh, trying to understand what the trajectory of their life had been uh, after fleeing Somalia in 1991, um, and then spending 20 years trying to find a safe place that they could get to. And so the book that my talk tonight is based on militarized global apartheid kind of presents or represents the confluence of these three strains of my, of my career to date, um, putting together into one like huge explanatory model what I'm seeing as emerging across the globe as ways of policing race and mobility um, of people from the global south for the benefit of people in the global north and so the talk that I'm going to give is rather uncharacteristic for an anthropologist you know typically I do a lot of on the ground really grassroots super like you know fine-grained ethnographic work that involves as Clifford Geertz once said lots of deep hanging out um, lots of, uh, of, of, of time, you know, sitting in people's living rooms and really listening to and understanding their life experiences. This talk is not that. This talk is a distillation of all of my ethnographic work and ethnographic work by lots and lots of other anthropologists all over the world in places I've never visited, trying to understand what the contours are of our sort of post-Cold uh, War, post-Global War on Terror world that I see as emergent. So I'm going to sketch this out for you. Um, um, in pretty broad brush terms, uh, and uh, then I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, so, yes. Any, uh, Are you able to all hear me okay, or should I use the microphone? Okay, there's a bit noise. I'm sorry? Does the fan have to be on? I think it's outdoors. Yeah, there's a little. Would you like me to close the window? Hmm. I'm not doing something effectively here. <laughs> sure I mean, as long as we hear at the back, that's the main thing. That's something that's better. Does that help yeah. a bit? Yeah. yeah okay, good. thank yeah. you. Great. Um, Okay, so as I was saying, as I worked um, with, the, with the Somali refugees in Lewiston to track their efforts to find safety over the past four decades, this, this, this project and this process made visible for me a structure of what I'm calling global apartheid, which um, I, I understand is a system that's backed by militaristic force through which people from the global south try to navigate the borders, barriers, and violences imposed upon them by governments and multilateral institutions institutions based in the global north. So building from the experience of the Somali refugees who I've worked with and who I came to know very well, um, the book that Professor Mukherjee mentioned and this talk, what I'm going to do again is offering you a very sort of broad brush view of a world order in which race and mobility feature as primary variables for which heightened security and militarization are the answer. 
As I am going to explain it, militarized global apartheid I see as a very loosely integrated, sometimes chaotic, sometimes sort of inchoate effort by countries in the global north, and here I'm specifically talking about the US, Canada, Europe, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, Russia, the Gulf states, and East Asia, to protect themselves against the mobility of people from the global south. This new apartheid apparatus uh, takes the form of militarized border technologies and personnel, interdictions at sea, biometric tracking of the mobile, detention centers, holding facilities, and the criminalization of mobility. It extends deeply into many places from which people are attempting to leave and pushes them back. It tracks them to interrupt their mobility. It stops them at certain borders for detention and deportation. It pushes them into the most difficult and dangerous traveling routes. And it creates new forms of criminality. It stretches across most of the globe. It depends on an immense investment of capital. And it feeds a new global security industrial complex. Because the new apartheid relies on and actually nurtures xenophobic ide ideologies and racialized worldviews, it recasts the terms of sovereignty, citizenship, community, belonging, justice, refuge, and civil rights. And it requires, I believe, the few who benefit to collectively, and I think knowingly, demonize and ostracize the many who are harmed. In the globalized contemporary, the emergence of a system of militarized apartheid used by wealthy and powerful countries in the global north against people in the global south is, I think, the signature form of globalized structural violence of our era. A lot of scholars use and have been using the term global apartheid to describe the historic and current world order, arguing that from the age of exploration to the age of imperialism to the colonial era to the age of the Cold War to the age of neoliberalism in the Washington consensus, through the global war on terror to the current moment, the global north has pretty consistently been engaged in projects of racialization, segregation, political intervention, mobility controls, capitalist plunder, and labor exploitation of people of the global south. While terms like imperialism, globalization, transnationalism, I think have been really helpful for highlighting many important dimensions of these global processes, the term apartheid shifts the frame to capture specifically the use of race and nativist language to structure mobility, belonging, elimination, and extermination, as well as the relevance of border controls and the hierarchical modes of excluding or incorporating racially delineated people into a polity for labor exploitation. So my argument is an attempt to build on this perspective by acknowledging the significance for this emergent world order of new forms of militaristic border security and containment. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about apartheid as it emerged in South Africa first to kind of set the stage and then I'll build my argument um, piece by piece very briefly for how this is iterating now on the global, on the global scene. From 1948 to 1990, South Africa created the most extensive and extreme apartheid structure in the contemporary era. Did most of us have an understanding of what apartheid was in South Africa, more or less? Okay, lots of nodding heads. Okay, great. I'll, I'll review it really quickly then. So apartheid is a legal edifice that mandates, constructs, and enforces the supremacy of one racial group over another. In South Africa, the, the apartheid system, supported by the National Party after its political victory in 1948, systematized white supremacy through policies and laws designed to manage the so-called or imagined threat um, posed by black people by incarcerating them in zones of containment, homelands, Bantu stands while enabling their controlled and policed exploitation as workers upon whose labor South Africa was completely dependent. The set of policies that came to constitute apartheid in South Africa didn't appear in 1948 as like this, you know, perfectly imagined structure of, of, of new laws um, or a newly designed model of social order that came in with the new government. Rather, these laws reflected and persistently expanded prior colonial era practices of racial 
racial identification and segregation, the restriction of voting rights to white people, divide and rule practices, divide and rule governance practices for black people, and the exploitation of black workers, all fundamental components of colonial intervention and control in South Africa that preceded the rise of apartheid under the National Party. So there's these, you know, these through lines to the imposition of white supremacy as a system. So as it unfolded in South Africa, apartheid contained five key elements. First, it, it, it relied on um, what we can imagine as an essentialized cultural logic that tied people to place through racial and nativist ideologies and discourses. So the, the form that this took in South Africa was that white people belong to these places and black people belong to these places. And that's sort of the places where in apartheid ideology, the different races were imagined as naturally belonging. And it's that same ideology that allows us to imagine Japan as being for Japanese people, and Mexico for Mexicans, and Germany for Germans, and that kind of nativist language that identifies who, who, who belongs there and who is an outlier. The second element was ethno-racialized groups in their respective territories created through apartheid practices were then made unequal because the territories inhabited by the subjugated were disenfranchised and impoverished by design. So the territories in South Africa set aside for black people, the homelands, were then purposefully uh, impoverished to ensure that black people had to leave to sell their labor in order to be able to sustain their lives. So third, the delineation of territorial belonging was reinforced by a bureaucratic system of identity documentation and mobility controls that perpetuated racialization. So black people couldn't leave the homelands without having an identity document that gave them permission to do so. So it's a border, border control system. Um, fourth, in addition to being a system of identity management, racial segregation, and racial supremacy, apartheid was also critically about the control and exploitation of the labor of the subjugated. So for black people to gain permission to leave their homelands, they had to be employed by a white person who then gave them a pass that allowed them to have the right to leave and occupy white space. And fifth, because apartheid by design is exploitative, unfair, and unjust, people were constantly revolting and resisting. So its maintenance then required a massive, pervasive, and super expensive militarized security apparatus. And then across all five elements was the role of the state in sanctioning, through law and policy, racial oppression as apartheid's distinguishing feature. So these are the elements, I'm arguing, that are now taking shape systematically on a global scale through a constellation of policies and laws, many of which have roots in white settler and European colonialism and imperialism. So now I'm going to talk about each in turn, again, super briefly, and I'm hoping that in the Q&A we'll have time to embellish those that most grab your attention. Uh, over the past century, so I'm going to start by talking about cultural identity, nativism, and this link between people and territory. Um, so over the past century, political elites have worked to tie people to place, bolstering the idea that cultural and national identity roots people in particular geographical places where they are imagined naturally to belong, as I said before. Tying people to place through the simultaneous creation of cultural identities linked to nation state membership informed the idea of immigration and influx control, making mobility seem threatening to the consolidation of nationalist identities within politically delineated territorial borders. Rights to legal membership in the modern nation state in the global north have taken shape through the delineation of territorial borders, the extension of rights of membership based on logics of belonging defined by settler colonialism in US, Canada, Australia, and Israel, or by heritage and the particular population dynamics in play under and following colonialism in Europe, the Gulf states, and East Asia. Rights to legal membership have also depended in the modern nation state on the management of documentation to identify who belongs and holds citizenship rights, passports and visas, and the identification and management of internal others who are temporary or permanent residents but who are denied full citizenship rights. 
A chorus of scholars have carefully charted how these processes took shape over centuries of what the scholar Cedric Robinson has called racial capitalism, the systemic processes of exploitation and profit that characterized white settler colonialism, plantation slavery, the displacement of indigenous people, and the creation of racialized mobile populations of, of immigrant indentured labor and workers. Currently, official policy and populist rhetoric in countries across the global north have cohered an understanding of belonging that enabled the delineation, containment, and exclusion of those identified as foreign others, those who don't really belong to the nation. And policing the mobility of those who don't really belong to the nation has now become, I'm arguing, a primary preoccupation of states in the global north through a growing array of surveillance technologies that turn racialized bodies themselves into borders to be monitored and interrupted. Did. Okay, so that's element number one. Element number two, impoverishment and disenfranchisement. So the second element of apartheid is the intentional effort by the apartheid state to render ordinary life unsustainable in areas designated for the racialized underclass, while also ensuring that the apartheid state maintains a hand in monitoring and managing such areas. So in South Africa, the creation of black homelands were presented as um, independent as, as independent um, sort of little uh, little territories, but the South African apartheid government maintained total control of those of those apartheid created homelands. Um, scholars have recorded across the globe the devastating impact on local lives in the global south of a wide variety of the sorts of interventions um, engineered by the global north, actions that followed and sometimes continued decades of colonial plunder, including things like military interventions. You know, most recently we can look to the US invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, austerity regimes imposed by multilateral institutions based in the global north, um, one of the most preeminent being the imposition of structural adjustment programs, for example, by the International Monetary Fund across the global south, corporate capitalist plunder, um, trade agreements that benefit the global north and hobble the global south, large-scale land acquisition for the production of biofuels, timber, and food crops by governments and corporations in the global north expropriating land and resources uh, in the global south, and finally the disproportionate impact of climate change um, on people in the global south where the primary sort of polluters and contributors to climate change are based in the global north. The aggressive penetration of neoliberal capitalism and capitalist plunder in the global south has, these scholars argued, created so-called excess populations that are either to be captured for the market as cheap producers, exploitable workers, or temporary guest workers, or made expendable through forced removals and displacements, incarceration into refugee camps, or just being allowed to sicken and die. Element number three, identity documentation and refusal or exclusion. So in response to immigration panics, the sort of Im immigration panics that we've seen, um, you know, particularly over the past seven years, the Global North has been consolidating what some have referred to as a fortress operation through expanding deportations and tightening the requirements for entry that reflect a clear geographic and racial bias. People in the Global North who lack appropriate entry documents face a context that analysts call crimigration, criminalization of immigration. immigration Immigration panics that conflate undocumented status with criminality or terrorism, drawing out racialized fears of immigrants and producing a surge of policing and surveillance to identify, incarcerate, and remove the undocumented. In the global north of today, just as in apartheid South Africa of the last century, states have embarked on programs of mass um, refusal and mass incarceration to discipline, punish, and remove from society undocumented racialized foreigners. Containment and refusal policies include things like the management of the international refugee regime, a paramount example of the link between nationalist associations of race and place, identity documentation, and border control, as well as the sorts of guest and temporary worker programs that allow border crossing only for the purpose of labor exploitation. 
So the now normalized practices of abandoning people in refugee camps, incarcerating people in secretive detention centers, interrupting migrant routes in order to push people into life-threatening environments show, I think, the centrality of racism for creating categories of the disposable and killable, and the lengths to which countries in the global north will go to restrict the entry of people from the global south because they lack entry documents. Such outcomes will likely only increase with the emergence of smart borders that use a combination of biometric and other data to manage mobility. Since racial profiling is allowed by the US Department of Homeland Security and by border security operation in the EU and Canada, there's no doubt that smart borders will continue to utilize racial criteria to target immigrants, especially the undocumented, for scrutiny and disposability. And just a note, we have in the room experts on all of these issues. So uh, if you have questions, I'm going to point out Jackie Stevens, who runs the, uh, the, the, uh, the um, deportation center at Northwestern and does amazing uh, work taking people to court and hopefully bringing them down for their deportation practices. And Louisa Moore, who's an expert in smart borders and the digital tracking of the of the um, of the of mobility across borders. And Hanno Brankamp, who's an expert in the international refugee regime and the warehousing of people in refugee camps. So we've got a lot of expertise in the room um, to speak to some of these issues. If if you have questions on those um, on those topics, apartheid element number four is labor exploitation. So while engineering the most highly elaborated border controls ever, the Global North still remains dependent on the labor of border crossers for a huge variety of jobs. Because the demand for cheap labor confronts the fortress mentality, many countries in the Global North have created complex, layered forms of hierarchical integration, policies that allow for the entry of temporary migrants to perform certain economic functions while denying them basic rights of self-determination, democratic participation, and civil protections, just like South Africa's past law system. In fact, guest worker programs in the Global North are modeled on South Africa's past system that regulated black labor for the benefit of white employers. They are specifically designed to create a flexible, replaceable, disempowered, and disposable workforce that cannot make demands on the host country and that will not challenge the integrity, the cultural integrity of the host culture. And then finally, number five, element number five, the militarized global apartheid apparatus. The global north is now investing massively in militarized border regimes that reach far beyond it, it, their own territorial borders to manage the movement of people from the global south, both to create an exploitable labor force and to contain those considered undesirable or expendable in detention centers or refugee, or refugee camps far from the borders of the global north. In arguing that the phrase militarized global apartheid best captures the emergent world order of structures of control, the argument I'm offering here signal, signals the normalized specter of boats filled with migrants from North Africa and the Middle East that sink in the Mediterranean while ships bearing European flags stand by watching but not assisting, of boats filled with refugees from Burma and Afghanistan turned away by the Australian government, authorities when they request help, of US border patrol policies that specifically and intentionally channel Mexicans and Central Americans into the most extreme parts of the Sonoran Desert to starve or die of dehydration, of women from South and Southeast Asia forced to give up their officially stateless babies to orphanages in the Gulf countries when they're deported for having become pregnant in violation of their work contracts, and speaking close to home, of a former, and we hope not future, US president who gained popularity popularity by calling for policies to deport all Muslims and build border walls against Latinos. Um, so that's my offering for tonight. Really eager to hear your questions and hope that we engage in some robust conversation. Again, with invitations to those who have expertise in this area to please chime in. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, we open the floor up to questions and comments. Um, 
um, while people are thinking, I, I could start off with okay. asking something. Um, uh, uh, I'm thinking in various instances in where um, uh, the rule of digital surveillance, how it also might operate in within the global south, mm -hmm. right? And, and the kind of carceral, carcerality, carcerality that might be prevalent within communities in the south. So I'm thinking very much in, in the context of, say, India, the way in which yeah. um, uh, how can that kind of digital surveillance on uh, Muslim communities within mm -hmm. India mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is panning out, or in Bangladesh, where in very much while supporting Rohingya refugees, they are being kind of sent off to mm -hmm. islands as kind of like a, mm -hmm. a, a island penal, penal uh, a panopticon. So how do we also think about um, the, 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 the very kind of manifestation of what you're showing in the global north happening in the global south, mm -hmm. or does that, does these examples then let off the global north to say, oh look, they are doing it in mm -hmm. the global south, mm -hmm. way worse than what we do, we're mm -hmm. doing it in a humane way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm just thinking of the paradox of similar manifestations yeah. in the global south. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a fantastic question, thank you. And the way I would answer that is, what I'm trying to do here is like kind of, uh, in, again, very broad brush, almost brutal terms, you know, lay out this system. In the book, I get into much more detail about all the ways in which the, it, the, these are not monolithic, you know, the global north is not a monolithic system, the global south is not a monolithic, there's all kinds of crisscrossing varieties and there's the whole cosmopolitan class of elites, business and political elites who guard each other's interests around the world who are based in the global south as well as the global north. Mm -hmm. And increasingly what we're seeing is these sorts of practices that are being developed in the global north iterating across the global south, as governments in the global south um, use these uh, technology, technologies against their own citizens, often in collaboration with governments in the no global north. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I think is happening is um, the countries in the global north that have created these technologies and implemented them are making the, way, the world safe you know, for um, uh, carceral forms of surveillance all over the world. And countries ac across the global south are equally scrambling to get their hands on this technology and utilize it in ways that, um, that allow for certain kinds of political hierarchies you know, to, to be maintained or perhaps inaugurated anew. And so I think, I think the world is moving very rapidly in that direction of sort of surveillance-based um, hierarchies of political exclusion that are going to somewhat quickly break down the global north, global south dichotomy that I'm characterizing here. I think we're, in the, we're, we're seeing that happen. And so what I'm kind of hoping is that by making this argument in this particular way, it just sort of makes clear what's at stake and the kind of world that we are bringing into being. Um, these technologies, once, once unleashed, um, can be used by anybody anywhere. And, uh, and they are being used by anybody anywhere. So I think things are getting quite, quite messy um, quite quickly. And so I, I'm, I, I love your question. I think that's a really, really interesting research question. I hope a lot of people are running around the world. I know that there's great scholarship in India and Pakistan on these issues. And and there's great scholarship about the way in which, in Pakistan in particular, some of these technologies are being marketed by the U.S. Um, and, and sold you know, to government authorities to use against their own people. So I don't know, Louise, do you have any more to offer about that? Oh, it's a great question. It's a great question. I mean, I think what, what I'm seeing is that maybe is so worthy of some comment is that actually the experimentation, kind of like a living laboratory, mm -hmm. that's happening in space in the global south. So some of the development by companies like Palantir, of biometric facial recognition systems and mm -hmm. gate recognition technologies that are not, not easily trialed in the UK. They are being trialed here, but they're being trialed by those companies who have contracts now with the Home Office in refugee camps mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. So I think, to an extent, those longer colonial histories, you know, which were often described as the kind of boomerang, you know, which was to, to test out mm -hmm. in, in other places these kind of technologies, and then to, to use that very um, experiment as a kind of case for, for sales mm -hmm. elsewhere, which, and actually it links to a question I was going to ask you, because what you were setting out was kind of almost territorializing or territorial borders politics of apartheid, I was wondering to what extent some of these technologies actually allow for a quite 
malicious deterritorialization, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. arguably then the, the personal data and the kind of protected characteristics of many peoples all over the world, including the kind of deeply racialized use of some of these biometric technologies, are precisely the training data which we then find being used for, you know, big pop concerts in London, right? So that actually the intimacy mm -hmm. of that kind of racialized apartheid is actually deterritorial mm -hmm. because present in the same algorithm are the patterns, behaviors, faces, and bodily movements of many peoples around the world. So I just, I guess, I suppose my question was kind of in this new age, this are we entering a new age that we deploy? Is some of that also a detour Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I think you're absolutely right, and where I go at the end of the book, and I did not talk about it here, because it would have just been too long, um, is m moving, as I was moving through my argument, moving towards making an argument that we're really entering as a new age of security imperialism, where um, governments, non-governmental actors, gangs, security corporations, are forming kind of these new, um, alliances, ways of both making money and policing populations that are deterritorialized. De and, and I haven't quite worked out all the details of how I, I understand this to be happening, but I understand your point and I completely agree with you. Um, I think, I think that, the, the, that actually the new world, I think we're in the moment of global apartheid right now, militarized global apartheid right now, but I think we're on our way to these um, other sorts of formations that, again, in my head, the only way I can think of them um, uh, usefully are, are, are forms of security imperialism um, that, that, that tie together actors in the global north and actors in the global south who share a common purpose in either making money out of surveillance technologies or in suppressing people for political purposes that maybe can be imagined as belonging to the same arena of people who, political dissidents for example. So I, I think um, it, it's kind of a messy answer and I'm not quite there yet, but I, I do completely agree with you. I think to the extent that, that territorial borders and sovereignty becomes useful in these sorts of border control and border management um, operations for states, they are, they are used. And to the extent that they can be transcended for purposes of doing things like experimenting with gate recognition or eye retinal re re recognition, th th those borders are then, are then transcended and, and obliterated. So yes, both, both are happening simultaneously. Thanks, that's a great question. And did your question get answered? Yeah, yeah, um, and we can talk more. There okay. are loads of examples I can think of um, yeah. uh, in terms of complex ways to think about this phenomenon that you're describing. Um, but um, more questions? Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you, it's so great to <coughs> present on all of this. Um, so are you going to annihilate me? <laughs> no, no, I, <laughs> um, I guess my question is kind of a follow-up to Mayanika's question. Um, so in India, there's a pass system that is this you know, requirement now for digital identification to get access to um, benefits. Mm -hmm. And it's something yeah. that really deprives a lot of poor people right. Right, that they have to provide information mm -hmm. that they don't have in mm -hmm. order to get these benefits. So I guess one version of my question is, um, to what extent does your argument depend on these technologies originating from the global north. Like, so, and I think maybe that's a different way, right? So, so mm -hmm. if there's countries like China and you know, India, the world's largest democracy, that are coming mm -hmm. up with this, um, you know, how do we, like, what's at stake in insisting on these forms of apartheid being racialized? So you could say, yeah. oh, these, this is apartheid. And I guess another piece of that question would be more historical, like, to the extent that one can document lots of instances of governments um, reigning in and controlling, enslaving people based on um, difference that is predating mm -hmm. race. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do how does like why, what, what's at stake in yeah. insisting on, on race? On race. I guess yeah. like the, the kind of third way to put that question is falsification, and if you're invested in that, like what would it take to falsify mm. your argument that this is racialized? Mm -hmm. So China, in, in my scheme, is is Global North. I mean, it's not. It's, I don't consider China in the Global South for the purposes of this argument. Um, and I think you know the the way. It, so the way that race gets mo 
mobilized in these projects varies from place to place. Race is not, doesn't show up the same way across the globe, right? So I'm you know, kind of talking a little bit more firmly about white black or white brown. Um, but I think that one of the things that we're seeing is the ways in which lo logics of racialized hierarchy can get reproduced in whatever the, the local context is in which hierarchy is useful, whether it's for capital or whether it's for, you know, for, for political ends. And I think that race becomes this very convenient language for being able to identify um, groups of people who then need to be surveilled because they represent a problem, again, to either capitalist interests or the state. And I think what we saw in the aftermath of 9-11 and the naming of Muslims as a race to be policed and surveilled and expelled and killed in the United States made, made it kind of safe around the world to, to create this expanding, weird, catch-all category of Muslim as somehow this racialized category that everybody in the world needed to be policing. And so I think race is super convenient because it's fungible. And uh, so I, I don't want to lose its fungibility in the argument that I'm making. I'm not making a clear delineation that this is just about white people and black people, um, but that race is a convenient way of identifying categories of people who need to be managed because they don't really belong to the nation, because they're creating problems for the nation, uh, because they have origins that are someplace else, because um, you know maybe their origins are in a, are in a class-based system of difference. So it's it's I'm not dodging your question Jackie but I'm saying it depends you know I think race depends on context I think it totally depends on context so it's like falsifiable like if you just go like oh like they're classifying people as different therefore we're gonna call it racial yeah I mean there are definitely contexts in which um, you know the, the 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 hierarchies or classifications may not be racializable but I think I think I think it's vastly more common to see the language of race um, at, or you know racial ethnic kinds of differences as the rationales that states in particular are using for um, cordoning off, containing, uh, and, and, and targeting certain communities for either expulsion or heightened surveillance or incarceration. Race is convenient for hierarchy, and it's colonized for hierarchy. And you know, race is a social construction. Races come in and out of existence. Races are made in in political struggle. And so the, the falsification would be, you know, how, what gets us to a post-racial world? Like we're not anywhere near. We're going in the other direction. We're not anywhere near that yet. Um, but that is a question that would be terrific to to be able to answer. I don't know. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourself then? She came out to know. Um, I'm a bioassistant professor in social psych. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, I guess, be, perhaps because I come from a, 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 a different cultural background, I was curious to, not to hear the words and concepts like totalitarianism and authoritarianism mm -hmm. being mentioned at all mm -hmm. when we talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. And I think for um, at least some of the countries and cultures which have lived behind the Iron Curtain, uh, being monitored with data like that, that was an everyday experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing new, let's mm -hmm. put it like that. And so I'm curious, why are these terms not used? Or is there something different about them? Is it because they come from a different system mm. um, that they are not incorporated into mm. the, the, the logic of it? And also then when it comes to this idea of security and monitoring, um, how does it differ from the practices of the totalitarianist uh, mm -hmm. regimes? Um, I personally think it's exactly the same, we just call it different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but maybe, maybe um, it is not. So I, I'm curious mm -hmm. where, where the Yeah, that's a terrific question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can really answer that right now. I, I, I do talk in the book quite a bit about uh, the, the, the move towards authoritarian forms of political management and political hierarchy. Um, I, Are they really moving? That's what my question is. Where, what yeah, is moving I think, to that? I, I think some countries are moving in that direction, mine included. You know, I will find out tomorrow morning where, where, where we are. <laughs> we're all in a state of heightened anxiety right now because okay. um, we're voting in the United States right now. Um, so I think, hmm. Yes, I think that um, 
I guess from my vantage point, the way I would answer your question, and maybe I'm wrong on this, and I'm very happy to be told that I'm wrong, and I'll, I'll go back and rethink it. Uh, but I do think that, that we are seeing um, the consolidation of authoritarianism as politically acceptable around the globe uh, in places where it has never really been considered politically acceptable. And that, to me, feels new. Um, and again, I could be wrong about this. Um, I could be wrong about this. Very happy to be, well, I'm not very happy to be wrong, but uh, <laughs> it would be okay to be wrong. Um, but that, that's, that's, as I was writing this book, that's sort of the feeling that I've had, that, 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 the, the, the safety, the, the, the pull towards authoritarianism, the, um, the emergent forms of, of authoritarianism that we're seeing across Western Europe now, for example, um, and across parts of the global south, certainly in our country, uh, the United States, uh, it does feel like kind of a, a, a political, a seismic shift. Um, and again, you know, if you think I'm wrong, tell me. Uh, and I, I, again, I, I clearly haven't thought about this as much as I need to. Uh, I think that's a really good question. I, I think it's just, uh, the, I, I guess, perhaps there is a, a difference in, in how things, so to, to my knowledge, totalitarianism is something that has been existing for right. long, and it's kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and this democratization or like, in many former totalitarian and totalitarian, there is this something called democracy, mm -hmm. which is not at all, which mm -hmm. is just a, a, a better transformed totalitarianism so that it appeals <laughs> to whoever says somewhere, oh, we now have yeah. democracy, but it's mm -hmm. not, because mm -hmm. it's just totalitarianism that had to like, Put some other name to it. Yeah, and um, I think so. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah to me, that there's a completely yeah. different shift, but maybe that uh -huh. I am not. I think maybe maybe what I'm signaling here um, and not have failed to articulate very very clearly is the shift um, the shift in the political landscape in countries that um, like to present themselves as democracies towards authoritarianism through using these sorts of tools that I'm talking about the apartheid tools and most particularly the surveillance tools and the use of of dramatically more significant forms of militarization than they had been doing before and um, so so that you're Right, I hadn't. I haven't really thought, you know, about the Eastern Bloc countries in, in quite the same way, and have focused a little bit more on the on the you know the authoritarian turn that we're seeing um, everywhere else in the world. For a normal thing. Everyone has a family member who was in that. Yeah, that's yeah. Not a new concept. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. thing. And that's what I think. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Similar. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I, I was also going to ask similar sort of questions, but I want to maybe take a different tack, which is I'm quite interested. In this sort of new that you're doing, which is sort of the opposite of what people normally do. I think, I think most, okay, I'm speaking a little bit out of here, but my understanding would be that from a political science perspective, you would see apartheid as a particularly extreme version of sort of territorial racialized nationalism. Um, so it's a particular form of a general possibility. Whereas what you're doing is taking apartheid as the general form and then looking and then saying seeing where it applies increasingly in different parts of the world. And I think maybe that's why some of these other questions arise because apartheid is a very particular way of doing things. It's not the same way that these are done. And now there are clearly traces which are common and these particular tactics that we see used in different places. And and I guess the these questions show that that does apply in some parts of the world and it applies to some like companies approaches to militarization but it's not necessarily universal so if you try to understand how that works in relation to say Myanmar or um, North Korea it would have a very different face mm -hmm. so one or two of those things might be working and that the use of surveillance has that so I wonder if that's why it's yeah absolutely and, and, and you know for an anthropologist to put out a scheme like this is a dangerous proposition you know it's not it's not the way we don't traffic in this sort of yeah. thing so for me it's a very unusual approach to take absolutely you know, as I said before all my other work has been this like really local fine grain demographic work and I just I, I just got to be in my mind about this you know and, and it really came from sitting in the living rooms all over the United States of all the Somalis who I had known and just thinking. That this is what people go through. And just starting to read ethnography from all over the world, and it's just like, and, and I'll 
obviously that was influenced on the time in South Africa and by this particular imposition of, uh, of a racialized hierarchy of labor and the mobility control. And uh, the rest of the cell was from, you know, sorry, growing up and working in the States, that was the have chimed more than it was. Yeah, yeah, like it was all the residences. And so what I did, you know, in writing this book was I retreated to my, I have a, a little office on the third floor and it's a little tower, like it's like a little pencil, pencil kind of thing. And I retreated two years and just read and read and read and wrote and wrote and wrote. Again, profoundly unethnological approach. But um, but I just felt like I needed to sort out this this situation for myself. And um, and, and the book, you know, produced this book. And I, I, I now, you know, it's out there, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to kind of use it as a basis and then say, but it doesn't apply here, 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 here. I didn't really think effectively enough about totalitarianism or authoritarianism. I really need to rethink security imperialism and how this model that I'm arguing breaks down in all of these ways, because it definitely does. But I also think it's true. <laughs> to um, kind of um, uh, discuss and, and, um, and, uh, uh, and think about uh, through, these, through these frameworks. And um, may I uh, take the opportunity to invite uh, Professor Tom Moll uh, to come and uh, give his um, vote of thanks to Professor Bestman's uh, fantastic lecture, which has given us such food for thought. And I'm sure the conversations will continue beyond the framework of uh, today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tom Mould. It's my privilege to be the principal of Van Milde College where we are this evening and my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to Catherine. Catherine has been in residence here with us as our IAS fellow throughout this term and will be for a little bit longer uh, still to come and she's been a terrific presence in the college and we're extremely grateful uh, to have had her as part of our community for this time. I, uh, I'm sure you enjoyed her talk this evening as much as I did. It was an extraordinarily stimulating uh, and interesting lecture. It was synoptic in its ambition, uh, ranging widely across the globe in search of similarities and connections that we can bring together and synthesize into a truly global vision of our current situation. It was uh, provocative in its uh, aim to get us to think differently about our global situation by considering it as a new form of militarized global apartheid and what the adoption of that term might mean, how it might reframe the discussion for us, how it might make us think differently. And so uh, I hope that that is a term that you have found good to think with. And it was absolutely timely and couldn't be more timely in terms of the debates that we are now having uh, in the UK, which are mirrored elsewhere around the world in terms of how we police our borders uh, and, uh, and our labour force. And uh, so that is a really uh, crucial, timely question. So for all of those reasons, thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, really um, contributing wonderfully to the intellectual community of Van Milde College tonight. And I want to say before we finish that uh, our college is an intellectual community, as all Durham's colleges are, as well as other kinds of community. And that's why we really welcome this kind of event in college. And I encourage you, if you're here perhaps at Van Milder for the first time, to uh, continue to be involved in Van Milder College's intellectual community, to look out for other events, uh, lectures, talks, discussions that we run through the year, to consider joining our senior common room, uh, if that's something that might interest you. Um, and to join us as part of this intellectual community and contribute to it yourself. So I very much hope that uh, we'll see some of you again at events in the future. Please join me in thanking Catherine for a terrific talk.